Okay, so today we, we come actually to, uh, um, of the books that you haven't got yet, yeah, uh, um, to uh, chapter two and uh, uh, chapter three. This is kind of the history where organization studies come, came from. Yeah? So we, we have that actually already for quite some time. Uh, um, so today uh, um, the lectures really correspond to chapter two and three. And you will see the history is actually quite political. Yeah? So uh, um, if you really go into this, uh, and, and we will do so in a second partly, uh, you will understand the various schools of thought that have influenced a critical perspective. And the critical perspective really being here a spin of questioning actually on what premises do we form our organizations or, or on what basis are they there. And uh, we, we go here into some uh, pretty historic stuff. So we recover some sorts of, of 250 years ago. There are even older schools. Yeah. So initially, uh, um, well, I, I will list you actually uh, um, kind of the groupings and organizations that were kind of writing more or less uh, um, the rules. Uh, um, yeah, some pretty prehistoric stuff. But uh, it will lead as well to understand how organizations <coughs> are examined using the critical approach. So we get a little bit of feeling for it and uh, understand how communication organizations and hey, why did I do this? Uh, understand how communication organization and power are actually connected. Now, even in nowadays organization, we, we still have, of course, underlying power. So uh, it's as simple, if you want to think about it, if you are the project <coughs> manager, you have some decision-making authority. Yeah, that doesn't mean uh, uh, use it, well, when we come to that, yeah. So uh, um, there's a meaningfulness, yeah, so you should use your power, but in a meaningful way, this is, of course, the key. So I, I hope at the end of this session, we actually arrive there. But I have, uh, um, as well, underlaid it actually with a lot of examples to actually think about it in today's context, yeah. So history of a critical perspective. Now the critical perspective kind of really originized, uh, uh, originated in three big theories, and they are all accounted to Karl Marx. Yeah? And actually uh, uh, in America, well I shouldn't really pick on them, but uh, uh, at the moment we really try to make his production paradigm actually a prediction, which is quite scary. But here's a theory of historical materialism. So this was an analysis of different modes of production. And he kind of looked at how do groupings organize themselves and do stuff. Yeah. So uh, here you had actually uh, uh, common ownership, which is often tribal. So this is, you, you are in a locality, you're a uh, fancy, not sure that football was popular at that time already, but in your community, you, you want to have a, a football field. And in many places, uh, um, this was kind of like calling together the, the most capable men, and this would be all normally done by an elder, a wise. And you would build a football field, and it would belong to the community. And it would be quite equal, and there would be some notion of wise wisdom yeah, that would be the defining criteria here. But only a few, if you look at the population, uh, Marx actually pointed out this is a, a very common approach all over the world. So the majority organizes itself in a common ownership. Yeah, but uh, um, actually this is not the art of vogue system. So it still exists actually in corners all over the world and uh, you may see it even in uh, families or, or other organizations, but it's more uncommon. Yeah? Uh, nowadays we, we uh, um, well, I, I don't say that it's the citizen and self, but uh, this, this is kind of the ancient model. So you had like a, a working group that was uh, kind of uh, um, positioned in an organization to do the labor. And uh, um, uh, here you have kind of the aristocrat and servant that was a folder uh, um, structure. And again, he looked here more at how you could actually uh, produce something. So this is a notion that stuff was pre-allocated in ownership. Yeah, and uh, um, I, I suppose uh, the one that is uh, most we know now is the capitalist wage labor, uh, um, capitalist model. So it's again, the, the, the main mode that he kind of stressed here is production is only possible with pre-ownership of something. Yeah, so if, if everybody gets given, for example, with first land, then you're actually jumping this whole system, yeah, because then you own land. So there, there are certain uh, notions of that, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, um, uh, um, starting point that he came from. 
And he points out each mode has an exploited and exploiting class. Now, this is the famous class theory. You may have heard of it. Uh, um, I don't think in uni we, we actually encourage you to read this anymore, but this is where organizational theory initially came from. Yeah? So it was a, a notion of disposition. Yeah? So capitalism involves a, um, a particular form of uh, exploitation. And, and this had to do with uh, um, the notion that uh, if you don't have land or if you don't uh, um, uh, own uh, assets that you can account for, equity, wealth, then you too should think about uh, uh, maybe uh, exploiting your skills yourself as a laborer. Yeah? And this, this was kind of the uh, um, notion that he kind of um, uh, recognized. Now, another uh, theory that kind of came uh, um, capitalism ex uh, as an exploitive system, uh, um, and here really process of expropriation. So this is a notion, you, the prior, so the owner that is there before you has already learned. Uh, um, it's really not from Marx, but uh, from Adam Smith. Uh, so here you were actually looking at exchange value, and more imp important uh, um, than use of value. And this was uh, um, Adam Smith's idea of when you put people together. So you have somebody that is really, really good in crafting uh, um, a stool. He can uh, craft a lot of stools in a certain time. So in an hour, he can make four stools. And uh, he's quite good at tables, too. Yeah, he can make a table. Uh, um, he can make two tables in, in, in one hour, let's play with an example. And you have another person that can make in one hour two stools. But for uh, a table, he needs two hours. Uh, um, now then, you should actually collaborate. And it's not so much about who can produce the most, but the actual uh, um, combination of the two, two stools and one table sold as a package. Uh, um, would then be desirable, and he kind of uh, went on with this notion of um, not really being after the value generated for the user. Yeah, this is still a very important uh, theory that we have nowadays. So it doesn't really matter how important the item is for you as a consumer or, or user. It's more a question of the exchange value. How high can you trade that? And I, I give you a puzzling ideologic, uh, this is by the way about ideology, and, and the next theorem is actually uh, um, kind of built on that. So here's a question. You can either buy your dream shoe, which you have identified on the web. And so you did a search and you have realized this is the best shoe I can have. And it's only 50 pounds. It's, it's a pricey shoe, yeah, but uh, um, we are happy to invest this. So you, you have now found out this shoe is available for pickup. Uh, where, where do we buy shoes? I don't know, Phoenix, yeah? So just to, to pick on a brand. So you know your perfect shoe is there for 50 pounds. Now you walk in and you notice that the Dolce & Gabbana thousand pounds shoe is reduced to 50 pounds. <laughs> now the big question for you is, which one do you buy? Do you buy your perfect shoe or the thousand pounds reduced to 50 pounds shoe. Now normally you would say this is a no-brainer. The best value for me is the perfect shoe, right? It doesn't matter if it was thousand before or if I buy it at the normal price. But it actually does matter. So people actually come into a conflict. So this is basically the interesting part that actually exchange value even in our logic of uh, purchasing power, yeah, of, of consuming, has actually created something in our mind where we are in doubt. I, I, I don't know if I want the perfect shoe or the Deutsche and Gabbana, thousand pounds reduced to 50 pounds. Yeah? So this becomes actually really uh, um, a sword for us. Now that is pretty incredible. If you play a game like this with any animal, they will be no, in no doubt, yeah? uh, even if you write beautiful signage next to it. Yeah, so uh, um, exchange value is something very, very powerful nowadays. And that was kind of uh, um, the notion. There's this way a hidden nature of uh, exploitation. So this is a surplus value is obscured. So this is a big question. So if you craft a wonderful stool, and then uh, Fenix said, like, you know what? We are selling it for you. So why do they actually get more money? Where, where is their money created from? Yeah, so this is a plus value. The point was really that uh, um, 
that there is uh, labor that, that is uh, um, going against the wage. So, you know, if you're a craftsman, you get paid basically per hour and you create this craft piece. And uh, um, the, the whole idea, uh, idea was where, where is this plus value actually coming uh, from? And the answer is it's actually kind of a market that is made up in the first place. Yeah, this is difficult to grasp, but uh, um, uh, um, most of the uh, surplus value is basically uh, um, created in the first place. And uh, um, Adam Smith and, and uh, as well Karl Marx were actually quite critical over this. Yeah? Now, surplus value acquired by intensifying the labor process as well. So uh, um, it, it means it, it creates a spiral because if, let's assume, the carpenter wants to purchase their own chair, then they have to make two shares to buy one share, right? That's quite weird, actually, if you think about it. Yeah, so there, there's, uh, um, in, in the system, you, you're basically uh, coming to a notion where, where he does work additionally. Yeah, but again, from a collaborative effort, this is actually uh, um, a better system as what we had before. Now, the theory of ideology, well, this goes actually even forward to our donor and uh, um, uh, yeah, if, if you, Anthony Giddens was actually quite critical of this. Uh, um, so this is uh, the ideas of the ruling class uh, in every epoch, uh, um, the ruling ideas. So th this sounds quite uh, uh, agent, and you, you have to keep in mind they wrote this kind of around 1860, 1880. So this was like uh, very fine writing. Nowadays we would probably not say that. It's more or less that it makes sense to join Facebook and Google. Yeah? So uh, um, this, this would be kind of the uh, um, translation. And the notion is that uh, um, the ideology and logic embraced becomes one that is actually adapted. Yeah? And ideology as a system of beliefs that uh, um, shape reality, we even have this nowadays. Yeah? So uh, um, if you go in a company, we adapt often quite quickly an efficiency logic. Yeah, that the company may strive after. And again, this is kind of recognized already in this uh, uh, time. And uh, um, this is quite interesting because still a lot of our conflicts nowadays are actually based on this. So ideology obscures uh, contradictions in society. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, here this was quite a conceptual one. So workers produce the plus value, but only capitalists receive it. Yeah, this is a uh, profitability. So if you work for somebody and they own the company, then profit goes arguably to the entrepreneur. But again, this depends on how you are actually uh, are working with this. Now, this is kind of agent stuff, but the big question, uh, well, there, there were a lot of uh, critiques as well. And this is actually one of the most scary ones, and it's still around. It's very popular, particular in the, well, King's uh, uh, in, in the UK, this was actually uh, one of the main theories. Uh, it was that evolutionary systems will prolong kind of our organizational models. And that, that is actually a, a quite a scary thought because it meant as well that you would run business against the uh, um, wall or, or organizations would have to fail, cease to exist uh, um, uh, to, to actually uh, um, create evolutionary advantage where, where better organizations remain. But this is still a very strong belief, by the way. Yeah, so you will still see that some business models or some projects that you may go on, they are just run to fail. Yeah? Particular if, if there's a, a, um, a strategic advantage to maybe do so. There, there is still, well, I wouldn't emphasize it that way, but uh, there, there's still a, a lot of this around. Now, uh, um, with Marx, in particular, uh, um, the old school of uh, um, yeah, capital theories, ideologies, and materialism, there was a very heavy focus on the uh, um, economy as a determining culture and ideology. Yeah, so this, uh, this is so much so that they kind of overemphasized uh, um, the rational mind of e each person. So the idea was that everybody would try to strive to maximize, maximize their uh, um, return on the investment that they have. And, uh, and this is certainly not true. Actually, there's a lot of research nowadays that has shown that this is actually rather the contrary. We, we find it very difficult to be rational with conflicting objectives. Yeah? 
And then there was as well uh, um, an inability, of course, to foresee uh, the ability of capitalism to adapt to social and political changes in the 20th century. Keep in mind, this is already uh, uh, 100 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, um, but uh, um, we, we had there certainly an element. Now, okay. So this is quite theoretical, and this is the old stuff. We haven't even like covered now the new Frankfurt School of thought. Uh, um, but let, let's maybe jump a little bit into this with an example. So culture of a workplace organization, uh, and I <coughs> wanted to start here a little bit more broadly. In, in a way, what, what uh, um, yeah, particular Marx and Adam Smith were describing here was uh, um, a theory where people, uh, um, well, managing people is all about getting things done through them, not simply keeping everybody apparently busy and happy. So, although th this was, by the way, a concern of Adam Smith. Yeah, so there are some, uh, if you want to read it, there's some weird uh, thoughts went into this. So he was very concerned that if people are not busy, they may start stealing from him. Yeah? So um, yeah, there may be a hint to uh, some of his thoughts towards it. Um, so the context of the work uh, um, organization, and, and see if this actually resonates with you, uh, how do you unleash the creativity, talent, and energy of the vast majority of the workforce whose job neither require nor reward such resources? Now the question back to you, well, what comes to mind there? Have, have you been in a place where creativity was rewarded? Or maybe talent, if you're very good at it, do you get promoted? Do you, do you get that spot to try it out? Yeah, Yeah, and energy. Yeah. Is everybody positive? Or is it okay if you're just uh, are coming to work and you sit grumpy in the corner? Yeah, so it's, it's, is, is, that, uh, um, is, is it reward? Yeah, this is a big question. Yeah. Okay, let, let's have, have a look at another one. How do you decide between tough management that forces a better deal as against a kinder management, yeah, so a friendly, yeah, that uh, um, hopes for a better bottom line? Yeah, so, or do you try to seek a third alternative that is tougher and kinder? Yeah. What, what comes to mind? Were, were you more here, kinder management? Yeah. Or, or more tougher management? Well, what is better? What, why kinder? Mm -hmm. Particularly yeah. after the sentences that I just presented, <laughs> right? Kinder management makes a lot of sense, yeah? Yeah. yeah but what, what do you associate with kinder management? I mean, like, some people, I mean, like, who are, like, really energetic and some stuff like that, if they get some tough management or some pressurized, they might feel demotivated and something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, if they're working hard also, and even though they are getting, like, not that uh, kind gesture, mm -hmm. so it might be not as motivating as they are able to. Okay, so uh, um, now you, you have already framed it actually quite interestingly. So if people try, kind of uh, uh, management can actually encourage them. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's kind of a recognition of their effort mm -hmm. and of their trying. Yeah? But implicitly, you're naming here already that everybody is trying quite <laughs> uh, 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 fiercely. Yeah, so there, there's probably some tough uh, uh, framework in, in the background, at least how you're framed it, yeah? But, uh, um, yeah, well, what about you? Any, anybody else? Thoughts to this? There we go, so we're back in a second to the first one again, but uh, I, I wanted to show you first, or five, yeah? Okay, so tougher, or, or what is tough management? Or what could that be? Yeah, so you're uh, um, working against outputs, yeah, and rules. Well, what do you have in mind with rules? Uh, Give me balance. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, just trying to balance the work time Sequence, yeah. So uh, um, you have to perform within a production theory, maybe, yeah, yeah. And, and what was the company that you were thinking of? I was thinking of something like Amazon. Amazon, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There was an example of a company in the United States where production lines people were forced to wear nappies because 
Yeah. Yeah. So th this is on the other side of tough management. Yeah. So that is probably uh, quite a practice. But even I mean, this is an extreme example. But yeah, you're quite right. Yeah. So this is a level it can come to. Yeah. I was going to say hierarchical for tough management. Yeah. Well, why could a hierarchy be tough? Uh, it's just more like direct management. If you get me, it's not like mm -hmm. like you know open in terms of people having kinder management being like that they could all contribute to different <coughs> roles and stuff in the organization. How it goes like demanding from each level. It's like up down. So you you associate as well uh, a probably a steep hierarchy with it, yeah, where you yeah. have like kind of multiple layers of uh, management or authority probably is what you're referring to. Yeah. And then it can be again quite uh, objective driven or output oriented. And pe people don't want to listen to your narratives. They just want to see did you deliver or did you not deliver? Yeah. So this is can be quite tough indeed. Yeah. yeah okay. So this goes in the right uh, um, direction. But think about it. Well, what is better? Is it better, tough, or kind, or, or uh, hybrid maybe? Uh, um, how do you? Uh, how do you have change, flexibility, and continuous improvement, and yet still maintain a sense of stability and security? Yeah. So this is another one. Well, what could that be? Change of flexibility and continuous improvement? <coughs> Here's a question. Is it good to get the company mobile phone? Yes or no? Often the news, off the shelf. Is this good or bad? It's good. It's good. Why, why is it maybe good? Free. <laughs> I like the thinking. Free mobile, yes? Yeah, very good. Also keeps you on the leash. So what, what, what is maybe the hook was the company mobile? Yes, on a, on a leash, what, what do you mean by that? Um, you've got very little excuse for not picking up your emails and being constantly contacted. Yeah. The assumption is as well, it kind of bridges you not being in the office is still being reachable yeah, through the new mobile. And that, that is just one. I, I worked actually for a beautiful company called uh, uh, PepsiCo, yeah, and uh, um, there they go a step further. They actually ask you if you are happy to kind of get promotions. They, they give you the whole package. You get a company car, company mobile, company credit card for restaurant, dining, going to wonderful stuff like rugby, cricket, uh, um, concerts, you name it. You, you get it all. But the small hook is you should take customer, clients, supply chain members uh, along. Yeah? And they ask you even about your hobbies. Uh, what, what do you do on the weekend? Or oh, do you not want to invite your neighbors? I've noticed our new uh, um, I shouldn't go too controversial. So if it's just a supply chain, it, it doesn't sound that bad. So our Frito-Lay partners, they, they are having a barbecue. Can I send their family to your house for the barbecue on Saturday? Is this okay? It's a free company car, huh? free mobile. Yeah. It's actually quite exciting for some time. Yeah? So uh, um, I, I, I worked uh, happily for Three, three and a half years, so not too long. But it, it was very engaging, and you know everybody, and everybody knows you, and then they're still friends. And they, you, know, you are kind of uh, uh, bound to each other, and you get a lot more money. You, you hardly spend anything in your free time because it goes all on the company credit card. Yeah. I even had uh, hobby sports like windsurfing, surfing, kite surfing, you name it, not a problem. Many other people from clients with the same sport I got even uh, when I broke my windsurf board, they bought me a new one. Yeah? This was not a problem. Yeah? So, is this good or is that bad? Now everybody is like applying for Pepsi Cola. This is amazing, I want <laughs> this too. <laughs> yeah, you have to keep in mind, yeah? so your, your, your whole free time, it's not just work and home anymore. Yeah? Your home is as well work time and schedule. That there was a small difference, and yeah, it was quite inter interesting. Yeah, 
but it, it actually gave me stability and security, so I knew that they uh, couldn't get rid of me that easily. Yeah, but uh, again, this is maybe at a high price. Yeah? How does the company deal with Oh, so this was the whole point, uh, uh, to have good relationships with them. But if you let them so, work for a competitor, then you have these relationships. Yeah. Was there a contractual no, so we, we had a pool of people that would socialize. So it was a network, uh, uh, basically, of yeah, largely young people that were happy to do so. So you noticed uh, um, more, uh, um, I don't, I don't want to say older people, this is unfair, but uh, there was an age barrier. So I think with 35, the kind of open home and uh, uh, work combination didn't seem to be that attractive anymore. So this was largely uh, um, project management, um, uh, marketing as well, a lot of sales. So we, we had certain clusters that were actively networking like that. But uh, um, legally, the, we, we wouldn't uh, uh, make any unethical uh, commitments. It was just of um, bridging the relationship where it would be more functional. But in practice, yeah, you, you would go together for dinner, and of course we would pay always on the credit card, uh, but uh, in, in reality, I shouldn't admit this now, we would write it on the bill afterwards, yeah? So it's, it's not a problem for, for us uh, um, as a company. When I was working there as a company, uh, um, you, you have a focus to kind of attract better relationships. Yeah? And it does work, it's human nature. Yeah? When I was asking you when you were in the city, um, when you left, you had everything with the client list and strictly taken away and we often make social relationships through entertainment so you can take your clients with you. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so I, I see what you mean. Uh, now, I didn't have that freedom. I had actually a secretary. She would have all my contact lists. So I would have it in my mobile as well, as well but this would be actually managed for me. And not just me. So as I said, there was a team and they would have clients that would want to see a certain concert or a certain sports event. And they would literally check who's available and wants to go. So, yeah. But you're quite right. So when I left, uh, I had some really good contacts, and uh, um, that, that was then kind of held negatively against me initially for leaving. So it builds as well this culture where you, you cannot really leave, or if you do, you kind of burn a few of your relationships. That's perceived as a thing you shouldn't do. And you get as well to know their families. This is another thing that kind of... Uh, um, changed a little bit the dynamics. So on a project contract, when they really don't perform well, do you just fire them? Do you send them home? And you know, uh, yeah, no. that's not question much uh, too far there. But uh, uh, yeah, how, how do you maintain control? This is the other side, yeah? You to give people the freedom of autonomy. Uh, auto I can't say the word, autonomy. They need to be effective and fulfilled in their work. Uh, um, so again, yeah, control versus freedom and autonomy. And I, I told you already of the PepsiCo example yeah, that, that makes you feel very free and autonomous, uh, particular if you compare it to maybe colleagues that are not in project management or, or marketing or yes, as well uh, um, sales, so the, the whole package or, or, or logistics managers even. So uh, um, yeah, well, what is the trade-off? How, how can you maintain that? And last one. Oh. No, that, that was, uh, um, wait a minute, have I lost one? Oh, yeah, we, we didn't have anything to creativity and talent. Did anything come to mind? Do, do we have organizations that kind of reward creativity? In projects, are we reward, rewarded for creativity? What do you say? <coughs> probably our best shot, right, in projects, because we are kind of uh, uh, remote from the continuous business organization, maybe, yeah. Now last week, uh, I think you hopefully had a single learning loop and double learning loop, and then becoming kind of a learning organization, right? Is that happening or not?
much as it should be, I think. <laughs> no, it's often not. You, you get actually brought in often for performing a set task, yeah, or a set role. And it often is part of a hierarchy or, or organizational structure. We have a look at that in, in two weeks' time, yeah, or once we, we get uh, past Weber and uh, uh, yeah, pa pa past theorems and come to more recent uh, um, organizational elements here, you will see actually that uh, hierarchy and structure have a certain feature. They kind of bring it together. You, you have like a chance to be creative and reinvent your role as a role <coughs> unit, but often to have an effect on the rest of the team or organizational structure is very, very tricky. Yeah. For that, you really need an organizational commitment. Otherwise, it is very, very difficult. Yeah. So again, creativity, uh, uh, as well as uh, PepsiCo, we had the same problem. Uh, building a factory, yeah? uh, construction main contractor, we would kind of tell them what, what we want. Then they would kind of uh, buy all the stuff in from different suppliers largely. And then the construction team would build the factory. Now again, here, uh, energy, talent, and creativity would be kind of just encouraged because we would have standards. So if they would be too creative, we would probably lose uh, out on the standardization or uh, on be the bespoke uh, um, uh, factories that we were after. Yeah. So normally, if we would be after creativity or innovations, this would come actually from us as a client. Or we would ask the main contractor to kind of specify it up front. Yeah, so we kind of ironically disconnected the process of the actual project from creativity, yeah, unless you ask for it. And we, we had some companies like uh, Davis London, they were actually quite good with this. So they, they kind of aimed at the learning organization. So they would kind of have a feedback process. And we would often only learn after the project. Yeah? So we would get a lesson learned uh, um, report and they would urge us to change our policies. They kind of showed us what was really bad from us as a client. But again, this was one company and we worked with something like 20 companies. So that there was no way that uh, um, creativity would be easily uh, sustained. Yeah. Again, when you work uh, on a project team where you are a little bit more remote and not in hierarchy structures and, and tight contracts, creativity and talent can be a huge uh, enabler, actually. Uh, so it can be very rewarding as well for the whole team, if you notice that you can actually bring additional value to the table and make it an, a better experience, even energy, yeah, uh, can make it a happy project. Yeah? And, and by the way, this is not coming from me, this is coming from the VW guy, uh, um, Rainer, uh, Hubert Reinert, yeah. who, who is a, a, a PMO director in a VW Group, and uh, he always says happy projects are better than uh, successful, not happy, unhappy product that way around, yeah. I'm not sure that that is true or if CW sees it that way, but uh, he certainly sees it that way. Yeah. So we had as well uh, tougher management, kinder management, change, flexibility, and continuous improvement, yet stability and security. We have a case study next week as well with that, where I want to ask you which company would you prefer to work in. But well, what is better? Would, would your your, your first intuition, what is better? Would you go for a, a st stable and secure job? Yeah. Maybe, maybe become an academic. Arguably, we, we have the secure, securest job yeah, and, and very stable. Or is it better to, to kind of have a changing, flexible job? I, I think it uh, depends on our job. Is when you're younger, you will uh, more likely to change visibility and continue improvement. But when you got older, we, you will be more stability and security because mm -hmm. uh, when you young, you really want to develop yourself. You need to learn as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you work in the, the GNC company, you can you can have a lot of chance to experience the new thing, and mm -hmm. as well as uh, the promotion in work as well. But when you owe oh, you, maybe you can will not like it anymore, you just need something more stability mm -hmm. and security. Yeah. yeah you, you have already uh, very well uh, kind of drawn out where, where the potential temptations are and potential worries yeah, or, or risks. So you're quite right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
change flexibility and continuous improvement environment, you get more exposure. You see maybe the same thing done in many ways. And you can really learn. It's a great environment to move along. It's this one very demanding. It's often performance oriented. Yeah, you, you're trying to achieve goals at the same time as finding new ways. And that can be actually quite tricky. Yeah, stability and security kind of comes in probably when you're looking for a support environment there. Yeah? If it's if that becomes too draining yeah, or, or too, too hard. Now don't get me wrong, there's always an element of both. Yeah? That's why in the university environment, they're not as stable and secure as it may look from the outside. But the, the point is uh, um, that there's always a trade-off. Yeah? And you, you can see that companies really fall, if you put that on a dichotomy, yeah, on, on one side versus the other side, you can see that project management can have both. Yeah? There are some project-based organizations they, they just bid for different projects. They always want to be on the lead project. And if you think about uh, um, constructing uh, football and Olympic stadiums, there are a few companies that go always for these design competitions. Once they don't get that anymore, it becomes actually quite difficult for them. To be fair, there are not that many companies that uh, uh, do that actually, but uh, um, it's a certain dynamic. Yeah, it's as well when you go for, uh, um, well, it's basically the high-end product, prestige project, and only attract change, flexibility, and continuous improvement to a certain degree. Yeah. And there's this way, in project environment, arguably, I'm not sure that that is true, public sector-based buildings, yeah, where you bid for local grants or national grants, arguably are more stable and secure. The irony is that both can be prestige projects, right? So there's a certain contradiction there. But at least this is uh, uh, how it's emphasized. Yeah? So we, we have to see if that is actually true. Yeah, yeah what, what do we do about this one? <coughs> Should we give like a, a more freedom and autonomy to our team as a project manager? Or should we hold on to our control and keep it tight? What, what is better? What do you prefer? probably need a little bit of both, yeah? And there's as well a question of the recruitment, who did you recruit, uh, or who was your team? And aside from that, what is better? What, what is maybe the issue of too much control? What, what do you think happens if it's too controlled? Probably increase the turnover rate of the team members. Yeah, yeah pe people kind of don't want to work with you anymore. <laughs> You're spot on, yeah? So people probably leave your uh, project organization, your company maybe. But there's as well fatigue with control. Yeah, so um, you, you can see it normally if you have a lot of deadlines. People don't take the deadlines series anymore yeah, so because it's, it's too much. Nobody can achieve it. Yeah, and it's a fatigue. You, you notice it normally as well that people actually physically become, uh, that, that is already the extreme, but uh, it's a very uh, quick uh, um, link as well to depression, anxiety initially, and uh, um, yeah, physical health actually uh, being compromised and psychological health. Yeah. Too much freedom and autonomy can, by the way, create the same. Yeah? If it's very unstructured and then goals pop up and nobody knew where this is coming from, it's the same game, basically. Yeah, so people are as well likely to lose. But if you have a clear goal, you have a capable team, and you kind of support the team members to learn, you kind of create a culture where they can say, like, hey, wait a minute, I, I'm not really sure how I would do this. And you have a training, or, or you have kind of an education scheme in place to kind of build the piece up. Uh, it can be very good. But what, what is, again, maybe a problem with this? I think they would go nowhere if they could be the best. Yeah, yeah, so okay, so yeah, you are afraid yeah, that the initial goal becomes like a massive goal. Yeah? So scope changes, and, and this is very true actually, so you have already the right intuition. So um, a scope increase is often a case, and you, you often have as well issues with maintaining timelines. This depends really how targeted the freedom and autonomy is. 
Yeah, if you're still all committed towards the goals, this can work, but this depends really on your recruitment process. Yeah. Now, this is something we will actually, again, uh, revisit in a lot more detail, so we will look at uh, structure. So here's a provoking question. The culture of workplace organizations. So this is kind of a core element, of course, what we study. study what works, what doesn't work. And I, I can promise you now, when I started reading this area, I kind of stuck with it because I was, I was surprised. What I believed was true, or, or what I intuitionally would have said, uh, didn't actually correspond to the empirie. Yeah, and this is quite boring. So if we can measure it and we can count it, and then afterwards find out that it's nothing like what we believed it would be, that is actually quite bad. Yeah, so, uh, um, but yeah, here we go. So um, is uh, Mark's theorem, so, so this was a little bit touching already um, on the implication in a more uh, recent setting. And uh, again, once you have the book, you can read up and I hope it will make a, little, a lot more sense. Uh, um, yeah. So um, the world of business are these, uh, well, so those are a few kind of quotes that I've taken out or summaries from business reports. Um, yeah, so it refers really to what we just said. So the question is, unremitting change, colliding priorities, pressure for results, um, the modern world of work, did you feel that way? Is this like an accurate description? Arguably, for you, it shouldn't change so much. It's kind <coughs> of, uh, um, you, you are still on top of things, right? So, is this true? Uh, unremitting is just uh, continuous, if you want. Uh, continuous, I uh, shouldn't use words like that. Uh, uh, continuous change, uh, colliding priorities, so priorities that are disagreeing. Is this an experience that you would say is happening in the workplace? Okay, some, some people not, some. Maybe an example, did you have anything in mind there? And, and uh, everything goes, yeah? Or, or, or how, how did it play out? Was it like a gender <laughs> setting? <laughs> a horrible environment. Just okay. go to someone and say, right, we need this tomorrow, and the next day, like, what the client wants this. Um, so you change your work schedule, and you change all your priorities, and then say, what's the business? No, no, we can't do that. We've got to do this. Just this continuous battle. Yeah. Um, Mary McKinley, and I hope I, I will get you in for a guest lecture here as well. Uh, so this would be end of March. Uh, um, she worked on the Terminal 5 project, and uh, what absolutely frustrated her, she came in as a consultant to kind of fix the project management. The, the project was not doing well. It, uh, there was already the perception it would run late. And uh, she came in and asked, like, wow, I've never worked with you guys here. And they were all sitting in an open plan office. And uh, um, she asked, what is the project about? And then no, nobody said it. Nobody knew it. Yeah? And then uh, um, she kind of realized that there was really politics in the room. So she kind of tried to get her head around it. And she started asking people, why are they actually here? And uh, the, the worst thing happened, so the lead project manager actually told her, we want to be on projects like this, we have never done that before, but we know that uh, margins, this is a learning project, so even if we fail, at least we are now on those kind of projects. Yeah. Now this is a disaster for all the other companies that were sitting in the open plan too, because there's clearly no open communication in them. Yeah, so you, you may, so one is kind of the op priority of learning, yeah, of absorbing all the information they can get, and the other team's actually there to make a profit, or, or probably trying to achieve a project that they're renowned for. Yeah. So if you have colliding priorities, this can be quite harmful, or as well stakeholders setting different agendas, yeah, or not actually playing with open priorities. Their yeah, priorities are changing like the wind direction. Yeah. Um, yeah, very good thing. Uh, um, no business or part of business is immune, so uh, it's as well the recognition that nowadays, well, particular 
I suppose uh, the, the phrase came really in my mind from cost cutting or actually thinking about outsourcing or changing. In the past there were some units in business that seemed uh, or appeared quite secure. Um, the modern manager must reduce costs, stay in touch with technological developments and understand the dynamics of your ever-changing marketplace and customer demands. Um, then you cannot afford to retreat to the apparent safety of your bunker and issue orders. So again, maybe this old management style of hierarchical going in your office and then dictating is, is maybe not such a good idea. Uh, organizations need to be flexible and responsive. Um, decision making needs to be devolved. Ay, ay, ay. You see again terminology, what, what is devolved? Does anybody know? Devolved? The opposite of involved. Yeah. yeah. So why, why would you do something like that? Is that not, well, you, you criticize this even, right? So why, 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 why do they write this now? Not sure. Yeah. It's a governance claim, <coughs> right? We had a lot of issues with uh, um, shared decision making that uh, lean towards collusion or, or yeah, monopoly pricing. Yeah, so uh, um, this came actually uh, um, from the banking, yeah, from exchange rates. And I, I don't know if you will visit uh, uh, witnessed this uh, um, two, two years ago. Barclays uh, um, paid with uh, a cluster of banks uh, um, uh, an eye-dropping uh, amount of something like a trillion to the European uh, um, Union for collusion, for settlement. They, they didn't want to go to court, they just paid the bill. Yeah? And uh, then they got a warning last year again that they're still doing this. Yeah? So uh, um, if your decision making is too close with your competitors and you, you can dominate whole markets, then it, it goes in the uh, wrong direction. Uh, you must harness experience, skills, and energize uh, of diverse groups of people and build teams to get results. So we, we have actually diversified teams a lot. Now there's a good reason for it, but uh, um, having said so, but this means you have to rethink really how you actually harness experience, skills, and, and energize actually people. Yeah, so um, some of the old levers that we actually will cover will uh, actually not work anymore. It depends on your environment. Uh, you have to be actually smart about this. Now, when we actually come to this, uh, um, you, you kind of have to look at this under the background. Uh, um, yeah, so this is actually a defining factor. So the important part here being, I assume that we are performing in a commercial and business environment. Yeah, otherwise some of these claims uh, um, may change slightly. But we, we have a look at that too. So organizational studies, you will see this as well about uh, looking at how even families or, or uh, um, social uh, groupings uh, actually perform. Yeah, but uh, you, you will see then of course the target pressure or performance pressure is maybe not quite the same. Yeah. Having said that, this depends uh, uh, on the organization. Yeah. So um, the framing elements here for uh, um, a lot of opportunities are business today has to be more efficient and more effective than ever before. Yeah? And we, we have even agendas embraced like that. <coughs> so business and people have to work smarter. Resources and business people as well have to be used to their maximum potential. But this doesn't always mean work harder, right? This means actually as an organization effective. This is different from making individuals work harder. Yeah? Although it's sometimes, as a manager, it's, it's a good feeling if people around you work hard too. Yeah, but uh, um, maybe that's the wrong game. Yeah? So uh, uh, groups and teams within organizations have to uh, be productive and proactive. Yeah? Then organizations cannot rest and sit on their laurels. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, um, Laurels, well, what is a better word for that? Or what do I try to say here? Organizations cannot rest and sit on their laurels. What could that mean? Shouldn't get complacent. Yeah, spot on, yeah. 
So you cannot just uh, celebrate your last win and uh, try to uh, um, cherish on that or, or to basically uh, um, yeah, rest on that, but you have to keep your eyes open and be on that edge. Yeah? So avoid replacency. Actually, this is a lot better than Lawrence. Yeah? Uh, um, they have to be consistently on the move. They have to seek new targets and new goals. Um, did, did you watch with uh, Michel, Who Took My Cheese? No? Okay, so this, this may be something that you may face with Michel. Uh, I'll, I'll probably preempt it now. Yeah, but uh, afterwards you understand. <laughs> it's uh, one of the key lessons is basically about that. Yeah? Um, yeah, individuals have to be able to take responsibility, work on their own, uh, be tough and robust. Yeah, so uh, actually, we even have said in project management literature, we, we don't call it be tough and robust. We call it, uh, um, what is it? In my mind, it has to do with immunology, but uh, it's not durability. And we'll come back in the worst point again. But uh, the, the key point is in our project management literature, it's about res resilience, of course. Yeah? So you will see that a lot of your projects and you as a project manager is about being resilient and uh, um, yeah, being able to be agile. You know? Hence we have the methodologies that mean and project management with agile. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course determined to the completed task, so task orientation as well, to be self-starters and completers. So we have actually combined here rules that we normally disassociated with people. Um, Conversely, no one person can be an island in a business. They have to work with others, listen to and trust others, and seek out techniques to get the best out of themselves and others in the group working situation. So there's a huge plea to be proactive, yeah, to be willing to change and then adapt. This wasn't the case in the past. Yeah? This is what I'm saying. Okay. Now there is always a question, and uh, um, oh, I forgot my handout. This is uh, pity. Um, okay, the seminar you get the proper handout with it. Now the big question for me always is, and this is kind of framing already the article that I want you to read as a homework: Is happiness important to you? I don't know why my heading is actually smaller than my writing, but uh, uh, so is happiness important to you? And uh, I want you to ask yourself. What represents personal happiness at work to you? <coughs> Just take a moment, maybe, maybe take notes. Yeah, here you will see in the handbook, I have actually a designated page. And uh, we will want to come to a hypothesis. Uh, but uh, um, I will explain it in a second. So what represents personal happiness at work to you? Can, can I have some quick examples so we, we get uh, um, an idea of what that could be? Or what is personal happiness? Yeah. <coughs> Motivation, maybe? Like, <coughs> you know, doing something that you enjoy doing that motivates you. It'll yeah. in turn make you happy at what you're doing. Just a quick example. Okay, so, but this was actually quite abstract, so this is quite a heavy one. But being motivated, yeah? you come to work and you're excited about it, right? Is you need to be motivated, like, you know what I mean? You gotta be motivated to do your job. You gotta enjoy it. Yeah, good, but you can be motivated by different things. Yeah? In, the, in the past, uh, me, where that, that was not so reflected, I remember. I came to this effluent plant project, and I was like, wow, look at this bonus paycheck that I will get afterwards. That was a lot of motivation in me. I, I didn't really turn up in the effluent plant. Actually, if you have been to effluent plants, there's a certain uh, um, yeah, smell, texture. It's, it's, uh, not not an uh, but yeah, okay. So there, there were maybe so this was a motive too, but uh, um, it's probably not a good one as you have. Yeah. Yeah. Ma maybe other other elements. So being being excited of going to work. Yeah, this is maybe a strong indicator or, or liking what you do. Yeah. Other ones? Did you have some concrete examples? Maybe your coworker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like uh, uh, you can cooperate with your coworker. Uh, when I when I, when I work to work, if uh, my coworker like we are friends, we make friends with each other. So 
we barely uh, we don't put pressure to each other too much. So mm. like we have a family and like this kind of family mm. in the team or in, in the work. So we feel likely to work together, more happy to work with others. So I think that will increase and like yeah. happy. Really good example. Yeah? So you, you uh, come to work, the, your colleagues, your co-workers, are not just co-workers, they're actually closer. They're friends, you're looking forward to seeing them, and if something goes wrong, they look out for you, you look out for them. Yeah. Is that going in the right direction? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so personal relationships, if you want, yeah? That work. Okay, T take a minute or two, write, write a few down. And then we uh, try to get a little bit the picture where we arrive with that. Actually, how did you do it with Mohammed? Did you have a, a 10 minutes break, or should we just push on and then at half we call it? Okay. Oh, half, yeah. Half, yeah, okay. And if you think at the moment uh, uh, what workplace, yeah, you, you can ask yourself as well, what, what is personal happiness here at university? Yeah. It's probably not quite authentic to, to work, could be. Yeah. Let, let's go a little bit around and uh, ca can I have some happiness factors? Well, what did you come up with? Sh shall we start here maybe in front? Yeah? I mean, like, we mostly uh, prefer to have a good output, I mean like an efficient output, but we don't focus on the process which we are going through. And that's why we are like stressed up, so like rather than not thinking of the output or the outcome, just like go, th go through the mini set procedures and mm -hmm. you know like satisfying each uh, process and doing all obviously the output may be good and so like mm -hmm. it's a good thing to not worry about the future but just do on what we have to do yeah yeah so this is one of our key tools in project management right mm -hmm. work breakdown structures maybe product product breakdown structures something like that yeah so you don't have this whole big product or service that you're designing as one output, 
yeah, where everybody is stressed out, but you have kind of small goals, yeah, small parts that you're kind of contributing with meaningful processes, yeah, and every time it's an achievement, yeah. So, actually, this is uh, I shouldn't admit it, but coming from project management, uh, um, this is one of the things that I really loved about project management. You had your task, your uh, um, to-do list, maybe your issue log. But once you had that uh, managed, and this was often long hours, I have to admit, but afterwards it was done, it was achieved. You went home, there was nothing in the back of your mind. Maybe you had to prepare a little bit for the day tomorrow, but again, minor things. Yeah, and yeah, This is not the same in academia. If you write an article, this article will be hovering over your mind yeah, for a long time. So it's maybe a little bit like an yeah, essay or something. Yeah. Okay, yeah, very good example. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, Sh should we go around? Yeah. Do you want? Uh, yeah. yeah, I was thinking, um, no, or very little overlap between work life and family life. Mm -hmm. Oh, so a, a clear separation, yeah? So that uh, basically the opposite of what I described was my employer, yeah? No, no uh, questions if on the weekend I want to, uh, if you want to join like another family for a barbecue, yeah? By the company secretary, yeah? Is that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, super. Oh, well, can, can I ask what, what, what was the most worrying uh, for you in, in a situation like that? Um, I wouldn't kind of say that it, it worries me, but um, I think um, just kind of when work eats into your free time too much, mm -hmm. um, it can become a bit demanding. Okay, so no, no clear cut, uh, yeah. no... Mm -hmm. Separation that that can be too much. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Environment, the environment that you're looking forward to seeing your colleagues and you know, enjoy working with them. Mm -hmm. um, psychological safety. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do, do you think of uh, that you know you are part of the team? That that's uh, it. So like kind of a psychological yes. contract or uh, no, of more along the lines of. Uh, not being frightened all the time about making a mistake and how it's going to be affected. Yeah. And that working with the teams that oh god, so and so screwed up, let's get it sorted yeah. rather than oh god, that's screwed up and another job. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are talking actually about this. This is uh, uh, one of the core arguments of organizational culture. The uh, performative environment of a project organization, yeah, where everybody is held accountable for their performance. Yeah, you're either doing it right, you're doing it to the required level, and uh, mistakes are not an option. If something is wrong, it's your mistake, you have to do something about it, versus a learning environment. Yeah, you're, you're doing something together. Uh, um, things are as well mistakes, but not called as such. It's a learning opportunity. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if something has gone slightly uh, differently than expected, then let's talk about it. How, why, why did that happen? Is there maybe a, um, a structural cause that we have to change? Yeah? And then you're in a very different organization. Now, to arrive at that is actually very, very difficult. <coughs> Particularly if you're bidding for a set amount of money, yeah, and then you have to perform according to the goals. Yeah? So this is actually quite tricky if you want to have a different setting. Yeah? So um, there, there are arguments that as a good project team, you, you should kind of have your performance, and then go in your learning zone and review what worked well, what didn't work well. But this is again very demanding. This is normally on top of the already performing project organization. Yeah, yeah but very, very good. Yeah. So the psychological safety and uh, um, yeah, did, did this go in the right direction? What I emphasized, mm -hmm. learning, perform. Yeah, okay. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Do you? Do you I was going to say about um, good working environment. Good. We need to call it see some of the members of the company. Mm -hmm. So what, what what would be an example there? Uh, Fair amount of work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Something like this. And, and do, you, do you see that as a negative or positive? So fa fair amount, is this like uh, nobody sits around? Uh, or is this like uh, no, nobody is stressed out uh, either? So either, either direction. Others, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So everybody has something to do, is involved, but nobody is like just absolutely freaked out and uh, uh, working over hours while everybody else is having an easy time, yeah? Okay, yeah, very good, yeah. Yeah, shall we, yeah? 
it could work with uh, like working atmosphere <coughs> or uh, would working ambience. Like uh, the workplace will be like a uh, eco friendly or like this will reduce the stress of the people who are working over there. So friendly environment, yeah. uh, welcoming. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, th this was a good point. Uh, when you, you mentioned this as well earlier, I, I really enjoyed this in uh, PepsiCo. No matter what factory I went into, they had a coffee kitchen. And uh, if you work there long enough, you, you know everybody. Yeah? So you, you walk in the coffee kitchen and you can <coughs> feel that there's a warm atmosphere. And in some factories, there wasn't. People went in, got their coffee and ran quickly away. Yeah, this, this was like, the, there's a general issue here. And it had often to do with the management. Uh, that, that created kind of a culture where people couldn't pause. Uh, it was literally too production driven. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so you could see as well that people would quickly leave an uh, environment <coughs> like that, whilst when you had a good co uh, co kitchen culture, at least in the PepsiCo brands, this was normally a good indicator. People were as well happy. Yeah. Yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, other examples, maybe? Yeah? I was going to say, like, self fulfillment, you know, mm -hmm. so like completing something, doing something well, being happy about the quality of it. Happy at work. Yeah. It's what you're doing. yeah, so the, uh, this is a very good one. Uh, um, so having kind of challenging uh, um, problems maybe or tasks yeah, yeah. that uh, by figuring it out and solving it is a, yeah, in a way satisfying element in itself yeah, that you could do that. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah. Other ones? Yeah. yeah. I got three more. Mm -hmm. So firstly, uh, I think assessment and recourse need to be clear to make, so I will expect that. Like, uh, I understand what I need to do, but I need to know what, uh, in which way my work will be accessed. Mm -hmm. Like, which criteria you are looking for, then I understand it. And it should be made same with the, uh, the reason or objective of the company, so I know why they want me to, uh, they want, why they want to assess me by that way, and if I meet all the criteria in the requirement, it should be a reward for the good performance. Mm -hmm. It's the third point. The second point uh, should be a training in the uh, at work. So I think uh, if the company have the training, so it like uh, have the uh, employee have to sell employment, sell development. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so it like they get better so when they work in that company, so it can make me happier mm -hmm. by uh, selling them. And last but not least, uh, it's it's very about personal thing. Like how like how much how likely happy you want to be in the company because you cannot expect one hundred happiness in the company. But we don't live in a perfect world, and no company is perfect. So. But try to expect like seventy percent of happy. That should be okay. Mm. So that the way you can make you happy by yourself. Yeah. I, I did like the last point in particular. Yeah, the rationalization. Workplace shouldn't be a happy place. It's not a perfect world. So yeah, seventy percent happy is already you good. Have to accept <laughs> something that is, is not good. So, yeah. but you have to accept it. There's yeah. no way to fix it anyway. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but, but so th that was the third point. I, I did like your second and first point were, were quite related in my mind. It's kind of the performance yeah, being related to clear criteria yeah. and allowing you as well to learn yeah, what works, what doesn't le learn. So fair appraisal, fair performance criteria, yeah. and then uh, nearly related to that as well your career development. Yeah? So meaningful uh, um, training, education, learning opportunities and the reward aligned with it, yeah? so as you're doing well, that there's as well an incentive, maybe uh, um, a higher role, more responsibility. It be recognized if you yeah. uh, do a good job. Okay, yeah, fair point. So recognition in a way that uh, um, this is as well rewarded as an announcement maybe, or yeah, so more, more softer tools actually in that way. Yeah? So this is uh, quite, quite a tricky one. Particular project performance, this is often uh, the first thing that falls away. Yeah? If you work in a project, uh, uh, um, then you as a project manager are arguably the person measuring performance, right? Now I've seen many different formats here. So for me, uh, um, on a client company, I was actually internally assessed by my company. 
Yeah, so this was within the project-based organization, yeah, and PepsiCo isn't really a project-based organization. This was more my office that I was based in. Yeah, but uh, um, the project organization often didn't assess my performance. Yeah. They would just tell me that we are on the right track, or, or they would tell me it's the wrong track, but often this would be nearly invisible yeah, to me. So this is an interesting model, yeah? But uh, um, this really encourages uh, good HR combined with a uh, uh, um, very uh, um, close uh, um, yeah, learning group. Yeah? So talent management is normally another criteria that comes into that. Yeah? Very, very interesting. Yeah? Have you worked in a company like this? Or is this more like the uh, recognition that that would be good to have? Uh, it like when I work so... Mm -hmm. I, I, I work sometimes with a part-time job and, mm -hmm. and I think what, what I really looking for and sometimes something make me unhappy, something make me happy, so mm -hmm. I kind of like just have a... Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, so ha happiness is as well uh, a <coughs> psychologically loaded term. Yeah? So if you Google a psychology of happiness, you will see you have to be unhappy to be happy. Yeah? This is yeah. a, a very sad observation. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, if, if you measure this on scales, it's actually a very sad narrative. But again, th this was kind of to make us a little bit think about what, what it maybe means to us. Uh, um, so uh, a lot of you were even coming from that lens, yeah? So uh, this is kind of uh, um, what I had in the past, a clear desk, yeah, so it's, it's quite sad, but uh, um, I myself kind of work electronically, so for me this is a clear uh, um, kind of desktop and combined with clear calendar task lists, yeah, but uh, again, the uh, um, then cluttered desk, a new computer, a new car, a challenging job, and, and here we came already to more meaningful elements, so what we had so far was a lot more meaningful, right? So this is kind of uh, profound. This is kind of Mark's materials notion, yeah? So uh, consumables, uh, um, probably a, a fun aspect to have as well, but then uh, there are certainly more. Now, um, this is actually a recent theorem uh, that, that kind of had a lot of the aspects that we mentioned here already. This is actually why is uh, productivity so disappointing? And uh, this is a good question. Do we actually try to be productive at project level? <coughs> is this an attempt? Well, what is productivity for you? Getting things done. Yeah, getting things done. Often a productivity is associated with uh, producing a product, yeah, but uh, you, you're quite right. So it's, uh, in projects we would probably even call a, a service uh, um, development kind of productive. Well, what is the underlying logic of productivity? Is it the constraints that we have on a project level? Is it relating to time? Do we try to do something quicker? Efficiency of a task? Yeah. You know how efficient it is? Yeah, effectiveness, yeah, and, and like kind of doing the parts, and then how efficient the whole process is overall. Yeah, so spot on. Yeah. This is one of the key criteria. Now, there, there are a few more to productivity, but uh, um, yeah, uh, if we can believe more work. Oh, this is the name, uh, uh, Morius. Uh, um, he is a, a well-renowned CEO, so it uh, turns out. But uh, um, he kind of uh, um, pointed out that, uh, um, that there are certain elements that you kind of should establish, and uh, um, this was quite meaningful because he, he kind of argued that uh, um, the majority of our organizations are actually driven and changed by the soft side. So it's how you're feeling, how, how your team feels towards the project. Yeah, so, uh, um, so the hard side being kind of structure, processes, system matrices. So having a, a new uh, um, laptop or, or smartphone that communicates nicely with the software, something good to have. But if uh, teams feel disabled in communicating how they feel is necessary, then uh, um, it goes only so far. So this is as well then feelings, interpersonal relationships, maybe even traits. Uh, are you extroverted, introverted? Uh, um, yeah, those are the uh, 
with a few pointers that he kind of um, goes towards. Um, so he recommends, as a, as a leader or as a manager, you want to understand what your people do, yeah? what they are naturally kind of inclined to do or, or what they are naturally do do. Uh, um, reinforce integrators, so look at people that actually bring uh, um, <coughs> integration to the team or, or to your work environment and increase total uh, quantity of power. Uh, um, so this means as well you empower others basically and extends the shadow of the future. So um, the idea here is as well that you expose people to the consequences of their actions and uh, increase reciprocity. Uh, what, what is reciprocity? Uh, I should have again used a different word from him. Reciprocity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what does it stand for? What, what is it? It's uh, giving and taking, sharing. Yeah. Give so, yeah. So it's an idea that you recognize and, and give, uh, um, while well, it's really sharing in its uh, um, sense, yeah. Uh, um, and reward those who cooperate. So the idea here really being that there are some mechanisms that can create a, um, a, a happy culture and it's kind of uh, um, moving away from the productivity theory, and with this by effect, you would still kind of arrive at a more effective and efficient organization. So, so the claim, yeah? So the old notions of structure, processes, systems, and matrices to actually perform is uh, um, not so good. And actually, you will see in your book, chapter three, uh, um, this is kind of uh, what we empirically find. Uh, you can play around with shifting people around. There's so much that you can do. You, the, the motivation seems to be a huge driver for that. So again, back to the people. You, you need people too. So what values uh, uh, does your organization place on people employed by the business? How does this manifest itself? What indicators would you use? Uh, um, yeah, let's... Uh, uh, um, five minutes. No, I, guess, I may as well print that for the seminar. Okay, but this is something you want to think about. So we, we want to come up with like a culture. So we want to frame our own culture for projects that you would want to work on. Yeah. So uh, um, what are the nutrients in your organization that develop and support people? Uh, so you, you had already good starting points. So you want now to build on your happiness culture and think a little bit about it. And in the seminar, I have a question for you to actually see what you are leaning towards. Uh, so this is uh, what we are following through with this. Okay. Uh, do we have one? No. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, then uh, uh, thank you very much. This was lecture seminar combination. So the uh, seminar is a similar format. Check out the uh, documents that I have uploaded. I have as well uploaded the template. I remember I got two emails regarding the template for the article. It wasn't attached properly. It's now attached properly. You, you can just download the Word document and write in it. Then you are already on the right format. Yeah? And again, keep in mind, at 5, I will ask you as well about your topic and if you want to work with somebody together or do it by yourself. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I, I see you at three. Yeah?